In this lecture, we are going to cover the pharmacology of drugs for asthma and COPD. So let's get right into it. Asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD for short, are chronic lung diseases marked by an inflammation and narrowing of the airways. Although both diseases share some features, the pathophysiology of asthma and COPD are distinct. Mast cells play a key role in the pathophysiology of asthma and are abundant in the airways of asthmatic patients. They are orchestrated by several interacting cytokines, one of which is stem cell factor, SCF for short, released by epithelial cells upon encounter with inhaled allergens. Inhaled allergens activate sensitized mast cells by cross-linking surface-bound IgE molecules to release various bronchoconstrictor mediators. The allergens are also processed by dendritic cells, which are conditioned by thymic stromal lymphopoietin, TSLP for short, secreted by epithelial and mast cells to release several chemokines that attract T helper 2 cells. These T helper cells in turn induce B cells to produce and secrete IgE antibodies that sensitize mast cells, induce eosinophil mediated inflammation, and stimulate mast cell proliferation. Alright, now that we have a big picture, let's take a closer look at how the mediators derived from activated mast cells contribute to bronchoconstriction and inflammation. So, when mast cells are activated, stored granule derived mediators, such as histamine, are released alongside newly formed metabolites of the phospholipid arachidonic acid. During immunologic activation, arachidonic acid is liberated from the membrane phospholipids with the help of phospholipase A2 and is rapidly oxidized by either the cyclooxygenase or the lipooxygenase pathways to form prostaglandins and leukotrienes, respectively. Now, these mediators not only promote inflammation but also induce bronchoconstriction. The so-called cystinyl leukotrienes, LTC4, LTD4, and LTE4, have been shown to be the most potent bronchoconstrictors. Specifically, they activate GQ protein-coupled cis-LT1 receptors expressed on bronchial smooth muscle cells, and increase the intracellular calcium concentration, producing smooth muscle contraction. Likewise, but to a lesser degree, Histamine causes smooth muscle contraction by activating GQ protein coupled H1 receptors. Now, asthmatic individuals also have been found to have elevated levels of adenosine in their lungs. Adenosine exerts its effects on bronchial smooth muscle cells by activating GI protein coupled adenosine A1 receptors, causing decrease in cyclic AMP levels, leading to smooth muscle contraction. Finally, in addition to this, airway smooth muscle is also innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers that regulate contractions and relaxations. Specifically, endogenous catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine released from the sympathetic fibers activate GS protein coupled beta 2 adrenergic receptors, causing increase in cyclic AMP levels, leading to smooth muscle relaxation. On the other hand, Acetylcholine released from the parasympathetic fibers activate GQ protein coupled muscarinic M3 receptors, causing increase in intracellular calcium, leading to smooth muscle contraction. Now let's switch gears and let's talk about COPD. So when it comes to COPD, mast cells do not seem to play a significant role. Instead, the primary orchestrators of inflammation are macrophages. Cigarette smoke and other irritants inhaled into the lungs may activate alveolar macrophages and airway epithelial cells to release multiple chemokine mediators which attract monocytes, neutrophils and T lymphocytes. Monocytes are attracted into the lung to differentiate into macrophages, thereby leading to increased macrophage numbers. Neutrophils produce proteases which are potent stimulants of mucus secretion and are associated with chronic bronchitis. In addition to that, these proteases, as well as other proteolytic enzymes produced by macrophages and cytotoxic T cells, drive structural cells into apoptosis, causing alveolar wall destruction, leading to emphysema. Lastly, chronic inflammation of the interstitial lung tissue, along with other triggers, activates the proliferation of fibroblasts, leading to pulmonary fibrosis. Now that we cover the basic pathophysiology of asthma and COPD, Let's move on to discussing drugs used in treatment of these diseases. 
So pathological constriction of smooth muscle is one of the main causes of airway narrowing in patients with asthma and COPD. Therefore some of the same drug classes are often used in treatment of both, as there are many shared mechanisms. One such class of drugs is inhaled beta-2 adrenergic agonists. The pathway of beta-2 receptor action begins when an agonist activates the receptor, thereby triggering a signaling cascade that causes increase in CAMP levels, which in turn leads to smooth muscle relaxation and improved airflow. There are two types of beta-2 adrenergic agonists. The short-acting beta-2 agonists, abbreviated SABAS, which produce bronchodilation for about 4 to 6 hours. The examples of drugs that belong to this group are albuterol and levalbuterol. And we also have the long-acting beta-2 agonists, abbreviated LABAS, which produce bronchodilation for about 12 hours. The examples of drugs that belong to this group are arformeterol, formeterol, vilanterol, and salmeterol. Now another class of drugs that is used in treatment of asthma and COPD is muscarinic antagonists, also known as anticholinergics. So research has shown that parasympathetic neuronal activity through acetylcholine signaling is increased in the pathophysiology of asthma and COPD. To mitigate this problem, muscarinic antagonists were developed to block the effects of acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors that are involved in contraction of bronchial smooth muscle. Specifically, binding of these drugs to M3 receptors results in reduced intracellular calcium concentrations, thereby leading to airway smooth muscle relaxation. Just like beta-2 adrenergic agonists, muscarinic antagonists include short and long-acting agents. The example of short-acting muscarinic antagonist, abbreviated SAMA, is ipratropium. And the examples of long-acting antagonists, abbreviated LAMAS, are tyotropium, aclidinium, and umeclidinium. Alright, moving on to the next class of drugs that affect the contraction of bronchial smooth muscle cell, that is leukotriene modifiers. So as previously discussed, mast cells are the primary producers of cystinal leukotrienes. Therefore, drugs that alter their action are typically reserved for treatment of asthma. Now, the medications in this class function in two ways. First is by blocking the binding of leukotrienes to cis-LT1 receptors, which reduces bronchial smooth muscle contraction. Examples of drugs that target cis-LT1 receptors are Montelukast and Zafirlukast. The second mechanism of action involves inhibition of lipoxygenase, the enzyme that converts arachidonic acid into leukotrienes. Example of drug that targets lipoxygenase is xylutin. Now moving on to another pharmacotherapeutic option that directly affects contraction of bronchial smooth muscle cells, that is phosphodiesterase inhibitors. One of the most well-known drugs in this group is an agent called theophylline. Theophylline exerts its effects mainly through two distinct mechanisms. First, it binds to the adenosine A1 receptors and blocks adenosine-mediated bronchoconstriction. Secondly, theophylline targets phosphodiesterases, the enzymes responsible for breaking down CAMP in smooth muscle cell, by non-selectively inhibiting their activity, thereby contributing to bronchodilation. Another drug similar to theophylline, called roflumilast, also inhibits phosphodiesterase. However, it does it in a selective manner by selectively targeting phosphodiesterase 4, PDE4 for short. Because phosphodiesterase 4 is the primary enzyme involved in metabolism of cyclic AMP in smooth muscle, selective inhibition of phosphodiesterase 4 by roflumilast results in better therapeutic efficacy and improved safety profile when compared to theophylline. Lastly, before we move on, I wanted to briefly mention a couple more pharmacotherapeutic options that are available specifically for patients with allergic asthma. The first one is a drug called omalizumab that targets the root cause of the allergic response. Omalizumab is a recombinant monoclonal antibody that selectively binds to free IgE, thus preventing them from binding to the mast cell receptors. As a result, omalizumab inhibits IgE-dependent cellular events such as mast cell degranulation, thereby preventing the release of chemical mediators that cause the clinical symptoms such as bronchial constriction. The second option is a class of drugs called antihistamines, which work by inhibiting the function of H1 receptors, thereby reducing histamine-mediated responses. 
If you want to learn more about these drugs, make sure to check out my video about the pharmacology of antihistamines. Now, in addition to airway narrowing, airway inflammation is a major component of both asthma and COPD and thus represents another important target for treatment. To suppress airway inflammation, a class of drugs called corticosteroids is often used as monotherapy or in combination therapy typically with long-acting beta-2 agonists or long-acting muscarinic antagonists. The primary effect of corticosteroids appears to be at the genetic level, involving suppression of activated inflammatory genes and activation of anti-inflammatory genes. So to gain better understanding of these mechanisms of action, let's take a closer look at typical inflammatory cell. The activation of inflammatory genes involves a signaling cascade, which is initiated by inflammatory stimuli such as interleukin-1 beta or tumor necrosis factor alpha that binds to the cell surface receptor leading to activation of inhibitor kappa B kinase 2 and mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. Now inhibitor kappa B kinase 2 activates transcription factor nuclear factor kappa B, which then leads to formation of a dimer of P50 and P65 nuclear factor kappa B. This dimer then translocates to the nucleus and binds to specific recognition sites and coactivators such as CREP binding protein or P300 CBP associated factor. Mitogen activated protein kinases also contribute to the association of this coactivator complex by phosphorylating CREP binding protein. Now these coactivators possess intrinsic histone acetyl transferase activity, meaning they are able to acetylate core histone residues, causing unwinding of DNA and thereby increase expression of genes encoding multiple inflammatory proteins such as cyclooxygenase 2. Alright, so how do corticosteroids affect this cascade? Well, it depends on the dose. So upon entry into the cell, low-dose corticosteroids bind to cytoplasmic glucocorticoid receptors that translocate to the nucleus where they work by binding to these coactivators and inhibiting histone acetyltransferase activity as well as recruiting histone deacetylase which reverses histone acetylation leading to suppression of activated inflammatory genes. On the other hand, at higher doses, corticosteroids bound to cytoplasmic glucocorticoid receptors that translocate to the nucleus bind to glucocorticoid response elements in the promoter region of steroid-sensitive genes and also directly or indirectly bind to coactivator molecules CBP, PCAF or steroid receptor coactivator SRC. This binding in turn causes acetylation of specific lysine residues on histone 4 which leads to activation of genes encoding anti-inflammatory proteins. One of these anti-inflammatory proteins is annexin A1, also known as lipocortin 1, which inhibits the action of phospholipase A2, thereby limiting the availability of arachidonic acid that is needed for synthesis of prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Examples of corticosteroids used to treat lung inflammation include inhaled agents such as beclometasone, budesonide, ciclesonide, fluticasone, mometasone, and triamcinolone, and oral agents such as dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, prednisone, and prednisolone. And with that, I wanted to thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, stay tuned for more.